Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. HDIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the Homeland Defense and Security Community. As such, our organization supports those working in the Homeland Defense and Security domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Homeland Defense and Security DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Homeland Defense and Security Research. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is John Clements. I'm the technical lead with HDIAC. Uh, before we begin, we begin, I'll note a couple of administrative items. Uh, first, if you're dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, uh, they should be posted to the HDIAC webinar announcement. You can go to hdiac.org slash webinars and find today's webinar. Uh, when you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it'll say view webinar slides here. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but you can chat with the presenters and moderators using the uh, chat box to the left. However, if you would like to pose a question for the Q&A session, uh, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. It is the icon that looks like a chat bubble with a question mark uh, right next to the emoji. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A, and for the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. Uh, if you ha have a technical issue during the presentation, presentation, don't worry. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, check back on the HDIAC website, and once the webinar is posted, the Go to Webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. So today, uh, we would like to present an introduction to the iPaws system, uh, Set Alerts and Save Lives with iPaws, which is the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, and it will be presented by uh, Jody Smith from the uh, I uh, IPAW system represented from uh, FEMA. Uh, Jody, if you would like to, the floor is yours. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Jody Smith. As John said, I am with the FEMA IPAWS Program Management Office and manage the IPAWS Tech Support Services area. So I'm going to give a, um, a really high overview of what IPAWS is and how it's used. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this system because you have definitely probably received an alert either over radio or TV or on your cell phone, maybe an amber alert or weather alert um, or from your local alerting authority. So IPAW stands for the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. Um, it is basically the modernization of alert and warning and notification to the backbone of our system, which is the emergency alert system, which we're all familiar with. Um, it is um, available to government ent entities, federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial users to send messages, again, via radio and TV, um, that's known as the emergency alert system, to cell phones, known as the wireless emergency alerts, and also to weather radio. Those are non-weather emergency messages. Not, we, we do not issue tornado warnings at the local level or flash floods. Those come from the National Weather Service. Um, what type of alerts our users send? It varies. Um, everyone has different hazards, local hazards, state level hazards, and that's how they determine what they're going to send. We do not permit folks to send alerts. We do not tell, in other words, we do not tell them what to send. It is up to the local alerting authority. 
Some examples that we have here are such things as missing and endangered people. Um, AMBER system is run by the National Center for Missing and Exploited um, Missing and Exploited Children, sorry, and also some state agencies that have been permitted to issue AMBERs. Um, other things are like, uh, for example, 911 outages, law enforcement situations, chemical spills, etc. Depends on the incident. Um, everyone, um, you're probably familiar in your local jurisdiction, your local area that you've received or opted into some sort of notification system that is run by your local emergency management. Those are known as mass notification systems. They've been around for a long time, many years. They include different um, methods such as reverse dial back, or some people call that reverse 911, where your phone, it, you know, they have your phone number into, loaded into a database and you've received notification of a situation via a phone call. Um, also can include text messaging. That's very popular now. And very, very popular now is through social media be in Twitter, uh, Facebook, Nextdoor. I could keep going on and on with the number of social media platforms that are out there now. And I think we're all familiar with and emergency management has had to adopt over the past several years because of so many people relying on it, obviously. Um, some folks do rely on siren systems for mass notification, dependent on you know your local hazards, et cetera. But in addition to these mass notifications is the integrated public alert and warning system. Um, it is a plug-in to these 30 or so alert, what we call alert origination software tools on the market. And again, that allows the emergency management public safety official to issue the through the different iPods pathways, being the cell phones, radio, TV, and uh, NOAA weather radio, which is important and in use in rural areas. This is the architecture. Basically, um, I, I won't spend too much time here. I don't want to get too technical and into the weeds, but there is a process to become an alerting authority. If you read this slide easiest from left to right, um, each government agency that applies to be an alerting authority enters into a memorandum of agreement with FEMA, basically stating we would like to use the system, uh, doesn't contain rules of behavior, no ill intent, you're not going to spam our servers, anything like that. The key to that, that these alerting authorities, once approved through their state authority, receive a digital certificate from FEMA. This is the key to use the system. Um, again, federal, state, tribal, territorial, and local authorities. They are responsible to secure one, you know, some type of software system that has the capability to issue an IPAWS alert. That cost is on them. FEMA does not provide this software. And again, these are commercial off the shelf products, uh, about 30 or so on the market. It allows them to issue, create an iPods alert that has the key attached to it, that being the digital certificate that is then posted to iPods. So the only thing that FEMA maintains and runs and created is the red drums in the middle, which we call iPods open. It is an open platform. Um, there, through that digital certificate attached to each message posted there, we verify the sender that they are allowed to use the system and what their permissions are. And we validate that their message that they are sending is complete and in sync with our requirements. And then we then, sort of like a mailroom, depending on which pathways the user intended to send the alert and notify the public, we, sit, we post to those or send to those different pathways so that they are received by the public. Um, most used today, I would definitely say, are the wireless emergency alerts, um, far, far more than the emergency alert system and the weather system. We also, when we receive these alerts, all alerts, we post to what we call an all hazards feed. And there are several, over 100 different types of systems that are monitoring for these alerts um, based on area and alert type. These systems are, one big one is Lamar billboards. I'm sure we're all familiar with Lamar billboards. Um, bigger ones, I'm trying to think, we're in talks with some of the bigger companies, but there's plenty of digital signage, wall beacons, desktop alerting, mobile apps, siren systems, and I could keep going on and on because it continues to grow. It's beneficial, it's great because it amplifies the alert. And that's our goal. One alert, multiple, reach as much of the public as you can.
So this is our adoption map right now. Again, all 50 states are on board, all territories. This is down at the local level. Um, we have right now at about 85% of the population covered. The gray areas are where we're still trying to close the gap and get folks on board. This map does, is not surprising. A lot of these areas are very rural. Um, a lot of folks are starting now to share these capabilities and enter into regional jurisdictions or regional alerting authority status so that they can um, pool funds and secure the software in order to be an iPause user. Um, we do have two states, Vermont and Connecticut, that do not allow their locals to alert. They take care of that at the state level. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit really briefly about each of the pathways that IPAL supports. Um, again, emergency alert system, still there, still out there. I'm sure you've all seen um, a required monthly test aired in your local area. The reason you're seeing those is because that is a requirement by the Federal Communication Commission who oversees and regulates the uh, broadcasters. So the broadcasters are required to carry that to air. I know it can be annoying and people have complained, but it is a requirement. Um, one important thing to understand about the emergency alert system, um, we do get questions here when folks receive an alert on their phone. They ask, why didn't it show on the TV or why didn't I hear it on the radio? That's because um, this is a volunt it's voluntary for broadcasters. They are not required to carry a local uh, public safety notification. So the alerting authorities, our alerting authorities users, they need to collaborate with broadcasters, kind of a new thing for them moving into use an iPods. Um, and that's probably all I need to mention there. And then the wireless emergency alerts um, to the right, that was the first, actually this was the first uh, stay at home order issued in the country. Um, it is a non-subscription based service. This, this is, these are the benefits of WIA. They, all three pathways I should mention are broadcast technology. So there is no congestion the beauty of it is that non-locals um, or visitors to your area, tourists, et cetera, will get the alert. This is not coming from your subscription service, your mass notification service by your public safety official. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It is coming from your public safety official. Let me correct myself. But you do not need to opt in for this. Um, so it is not a text message. There's no network congestion. It is straight broadcast. All major carriers and many, many of the smaller um, cell carriers are on board. It's very fast. I mean, there is that attention grabbing tone and that is for a reason. Um, it's meant to get your attention. If a safety official, if a public safety official is issuing a wireless alert, it's typically at a heightened hierarchy in their process for issuing anything to the public. Um, it does support, we do support polygons and circles with the wireless alerts. This is important because it can help constrain distribution. Very important in very large counties or a very large state. For example, California, where you wouldn't want to issue for the entire state something going on in Northern California. Um, we are working towards getting, um, making this even better with a new feature of the wireless emergency alerts. Actually, it's a feature on the cell phones themselves. <clears throat> it is called enhanced geofencing. And what that means is that an alerting authority can draw a polygon and 100% of the phones located within that polygon should receive and present the alert. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Today, only about 64% of phones are capable. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm about to let Clayton take over. So yeah, only about 65. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Clayton. I'm a training and exercise specialist here supporting FEMA iPaws. Um, like Jody was saying, only 64% of the phones are capable. Um, and what, what device-based geofencing is, is that phone is what's going to recognize if it is in that polygon uh, or, or circle. So the phone knows whether or not it needs to activate. Um, but with that said, this number is only going to keep increasing as old phones start to fall off the market and new phones come on the market. That number will only increase. So next we have NWEM dis distribution or non-weather emergency messages. Um, again, this is countywide. So the WIA is the only pathway where you can constrain to a polygon. The NWEM as well as the EAS are going to go to the county. 
Um, so you can select the NWEM pathway, which will send to NOAA weather radios. Um, keep in mind with this, that as it goes through IPAWS open, it will go to the NWS gateway and a field officer can potentially make minimal edits. And then that field officer will send that out and it will reach the radios within that county area. So oh, go ahead. <laughs> He's doing great. So another thing that we like to add, um, we is also support phone numbers and links, which is great. Um, as one thing we did forget to mention with the WIAs is you have to send a 90 character message, but you also have the option of sending a 360 character message. With these character limitations, you don't always get to send all of the information. You don't get to give the whole picture to the population you're sending that message to. So we highly recommend adding in um, a link. Here you'll see a shortened link. Again, that's gonna help you save on that character count. But what this does, this clickable link allows your community that you're sending this message to, to be able to click on it and go to another page where you have unlimited information that you can give them. So you're taking 360 characters and you can re-divert them to another web page like this, some sort of GIS web page or social media web page, and you can give them so much more information. So here we have social media. You'll see a lot of this is redacted, um, but it, it still definitely gives the picture here. You can see here on the left, we have a 90 character message. So you can see that there's really not a lot of information there, right? But they gave that clickable link. So when somebody gets this message and they click on this link, it takes them to their Twitter page and now they get so much more information. So it really kind of helps amplify the, the we a message gets it out there. You have that loud tone, attention grabbing tone, as Jody mentioned. And then you can use this other source to help give more information. Um, we do recommend, we do want to point out that if you're sending people to your own web page, please make sure that that web page is ready to handle the amount of traffic that it could potentially receive. And then as well as phone numbers, if you're gonna send, if you're gonna add a phone number, again, make sure the amount of traffic that is gonna reach that phone number is not gonna crash that system. And then please give them a heads up. Don't let them just get smacked with a whole bunch of phones and not be ready for it. So I know Jody touched on cross-jurisdictional alerting a little bit ago. Um, this is something else that we highly recommend. It, it does quite a few things. Um, and you can see here, it's, it's gonna minimize redundant alerts. It's gonna minimize contradictory messaging and over alerting. So how this works is you're gonna have to get an MOU or MOA signed with that other county. And we, we definitely recommend that you define parameters further than that, something along the lines of, you know, how is the request gonna be sent? What are you authorized to send for another county? Things along those lines but it really allows for backup alerting as well as being able to communicate with those other collaborative operating groups or COGS, as we say, you can communicate with them and, and ensure that you're all saying the same message or you're not contradicting another county. The other thing I wanted to add, if you look down at the bottom right, if you live right on the line of that county, chances are if they're sending it countywide, you might get two messages. Right, and that's going to have to deal with the overshoot that we mentioned earlier. But with this, with cross-jurisdictional alerting, you can kind of prevent that or at least mitigate that so that you're not getting contradictory messaging. You're not getting over-alerted, which is going to then cause alert fatigue, which I don't think we're really going to get quite into that today. Um, but that is also another factor. You want me to take that one? I'm back. I apologize, everyone. So these are some of the metrics. Um, these are approximations, but this is typically what we see in a month. We process about 44,000 messages. That does include the weather service and all of the weather alerts, which is our largest user. <clears throat> but still, it shows the capability of the system and how, how active our system is. Um, to date, we have been, uh, NICMEC has been, success, has successfully NICMEC alerting has successfully, due to WIAs, has recovered 131 children. 
Um, that's very, that's impressive. Uh, we have heard from several state agencies and the National Center, the timing of recovering the child because of the wireless alert has drastically decreased. So we're very proud of that. And to the right, you can see we um, the bar graph that kind of shows when we first rolled the wireless system out in 2012 and how it's increased over <clears throat> the years. Obviously, 2019, 2020 gave the system a lot of use due to the pandemic. A lot of folks got used to using the system and it continues. We see now moving into 22, <clears throat> maintaining that level of usage. All right, so now we're going to kind of get into the two different um, networks that we have. You'll have the live and then the demo. So as Jody was saying earlier, when you get your certificates, you'll actually get two. So you'll get a production or a live cert, and then you'll also get the demo cert. So what the demo cert is, is we have essentially mimicked the live environment. So you, everything you do is exactly the same. You just send it on the demo certificate, and that message will only come to us here at the TSSF that will not go out on a live broadcast. Okay, and what this really does is it allows local alerting authorities to practice. We know this is a very nerve wracking thing when you're tasked with pushing the button and sending out that alert. So with the demo environment, you can test as much as you want and you do not have to worry about that errant alert going out into the live environment. If you look down to the right, we also have what's called the message viewer. Uh, that's kind of in between. You'll see the, the blue cell phone and the blue little TV with the bunny ears. We've had, that has been created to help show that your message has been successful. So when you practice and you're sending test alert or alerts in the demo environment, you can then go to that message viewer and you can pull that up and it will show every pathway you selected. It'll give you a green check mark and let you know that you did send it correctly. Um, if you look to the further to the right, you'll see the yellow box with the red lights and then the, the tablet right below that. That's just another example of those downstream devices that are pointed at the all hazards feed that Jody was talking about. It'll pull those. And those are really neat because you can set them up to pull specific alerts from specific areas. It's, it's very modular. It's, it's really neat to be able to, to get in there and customize the alert you want to pull. So we'll kind of get into monthly proficiency demonstration. So being an alerting authority, it is now mandated that you send a monthly proficiency demonstration, so a message into the demo environment once a month. Now, why do we do this? Well, it's, it's practice, right? So we want, we want alerting authorities to practice their message crafting, practice um, building templates, practice or validate your software capabilities, fully understand how your tool works and how you're gonna send that message. And then as well as employee capabilities, right? We know that there's a, a large turnover in emergency management, emergency communications. So being able to test and train those employees to make sure when you have to send that live alert, they are ready to do that. We also use this to help lessen errant alerts, again, through practice and improve processes and procedures. So if you miss one month, you, you'll get a kind reminder saying, hey, you forgot to send this. You forgot to send your, your monthly proficiency demonstration. The second month you miss it, we're going to uh, contact your state authority. And then the third month, you're going to run the risk of having your live certificate disabled. So you will not be able to send a live certificate until you satisfy that monthly proficiency demonstration. Wait, so I kind of want to... A question come in if you'd like to... Yes, yeah, please. Uh, put it up on the screen. So a uh, question from Michael Middleton. Has iPaws been used for any aviation alerting, i.e. flight hazards, airport and or aviation facility alerts, et cetera? Um, I can't think of any aviation emergencies offhand, but we do have um, some of the larger international airports are alerting authorities, LAX, one, DCA, a Miami-Dade, um, I mean Miami, and I'd have to think of a few more, but uh, they, they do have the capability. For, in order for these uh, 
these facilities, these airports to have the capability, they have to work with their local county government or local emergency management, and then also the state for approval. So that falls along the line of uh, Department of Transportation. We did uh, just in, enable Depart uh, Virginia Department of Transportation as a user, who now will also back up the state of Virginia. So more, we're getting more and more folks asking to become alerting authorities at these type of government funded agencies. Of course, you know, that doesn't include, we have some universities, state funded, you know, University of Alabama is a large one, large concerts, large sporting events, et cetera, that are alerting authorities. Sorry, I probably said too much there, but I hope I answer that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So kind of getting into what we do here at the Technical Support Services Facility or the TSSF, you may also hear it as the lab, but we're going by the TSSF now. Um, probably our biggest thing is we offer 24 seven technical support. So if a local alerting authority is trying to get an alert out and it's failing or they're, it's, it's something's just not working, you can give us a call at any time. Somebody is going to answer. Well, we have some great analysts here. They will walk you through no problem to get that alert out. We also do, we will also troubleshoot errant alerts um, and we can run status codes. So if you're trying to test or again, that alert's not going out, we can pull some status codes and, and kind of let you know what's what's going on, why it's not running or why it's not working correctly. We do a lot of teaching and education as well as resource development. So kind of getting into that teaching and education, we will help with proficiency demonstration. Um, we also do a lot of IPAWS focus exercises, which I think is, is kind of big for, for this group. Um, we, we can work with local alerting authorities and others, as long as we have that local alerting authority, we can absolutely help or run tabletop and functional exercises. We also help with full scale exercises. If you're looking for some iPods injects, we can, we can definitely work with you on that. Um, we do a lot of interactive seminars, conferences, and workshops, again, kind of falling under those exercises, um, but we, we can absolutely customize that training as well which I think is another big point for us is, you know, if you're crawling, we're not going to send you through a run developed exercise. We're going to, we're going to get you walking. If you're walking, we want to get you running. And then if you're running, we really want to help you validate and, and run even faster, really. So we, we can definitely customize for your needs. Um, we do attend conferences and speaking engagements. So if you are at any of these big conferences dealing with public safety or emergency management, please look us up. Um, and then again, like I already mentioned refresher training and iPods overview, but we also do a lot of vendor support. So we, we work with vendors who are creating either working with the alerting tools. We also work with vendors who are trying to create and develop uh, those downstream devices or those devices pointed at the all hazards feed. Um, so we work with them as well. And then kind of bottom line, we're a hands-on learning facility with end-to-end -end demonstration capabilities. So when you come here, we can show, we can have you send that message. We can show it go across the, the screen. We can show you how a lot of these downstream devices work. Um, so it really is hands-on and it's, again, it's end to end. So this is the website that you can get our resources. We've actually created monthly proficiency demonstration scenarios or scenario-based MPDs. Uh, coming from the military, this is kind of the hip pocket training, if you will. It's, it's, a, it's a quick scenario that you can extend or shorten to fit your needs, but it, it helps give substance to, to the training. It helps, it helps with crafting the message, kind of running it through your checks or your thresholds to be able to send that message. It just, again, it kind of just gives a little bit extra, especially when you're sending your MPD, you're not just sending test, test, test and sending it off to, to check that box. Um, Another thing that we do is we do a one and a half to two hour quarterly tabletop exercise. Uh, we have one here on March 1st, unfortunately, or fortunately, that has been filled up. We actually had to cap that off. So our next one is going to be May. It might not be April 19th. I know that's what's on the screen, but we were going to have to adjust slightly, um, but definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, but again, that's just kind of a two hour quick exercise to again, get a lot of emergency managed professor professionals, excuse me, together to kind of talk about how they're going to work through these scenarios, how they use iPaws, 
Um, again, just to get people together to discuss and learn from each other. Hazards go kind of the full gauntlet there. You get extreme weather. We do complex events and then we do law enforcement as well. Another thing that I really like is the IPAWS program planning toolkit. It's, it's designed for FSLTTs to develop and like it says here, mature their program, but it's, it's really customizable. Um, you can have, you can do it one of two ways on the website. It'll actually take you through and do an interactive build of this um, document, or you can download it and you can fill it out yourself. But what I really like about it is it's, it's very customizable. It's very holistic, but it's very customizable. So you can use what you want and make it smaller and put it on as an annex to any kind of current plan that you have, or you can kind of extend it and you can make it a standalone document. So either way, it's, it's very flexible, very modular. Uh, so this is kind of wrapping up what we have today. Again, um, it's gonna be roughly May for our next quarterly tabletop exercise. But March 9th, we are doing a cross-cultural communications alert, warning and notification. Um, that went out over Gov Delivery. It's on our LinkedIn and our website. If you cannot find it, you can absolutely send Jen Myers, who is the training and exercise sector lead here at the TSSF, uh, or myself. And we will definitely get you that link. But uh, that's that's all we have today. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any questions. We can pause for a moment to see. Uh, there's no questions in the Q and A right now. Um, nothing being said in the chat, but we can give it a minute. Um, and of course, if if anybody you know leaves this presentation is up online. Uh, at hdi.org slash webinars. You can find the iPods webinar. So if you need to get back in touch with, uh, with Clayton or Jennifer there or, or with the iPods team, you can certainly pull the, um, pull the presentation down from there and, and get the information that you need. Or if you need to take this to somebody, um, you want to show somebody what the capabilities are or you know training opportunities with it, and then, of course, HDIAC is always reachable at contact at HDIAC.org, and I can uh, reach out to, to the team for you or link you up with them if, you, if all else fails. But right now, uh, it, I don't see any questions coming in. Um, so I think I will call it, a call it there. Um, if, if anybody does have any questions that they think of, again, you have the contact information there and you can reach me at contact at hdioc.org. But uh, Clayton and Jody, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. It was a wonderful overview of the iPaul system. Uh, Clayton, very good job stepping in there, uh, uh, picking, up, picking up the ball. Uh, but uh, I do appreciate it and uh, look for this to be posted on our YouTube site within the next day or so. Thank you for having us. We, we definitely appreciate it. Thank you.